Hello and uh, welcome everybody to today's uh, webinar when we talk about money, the past, the present and the future. I'm Simon Sarevsky, research assistant at the Austrian Economic Center. And today with me, I have Professor Larry White, who is a professor of economics at the George Mason University. He's a distinguished senior fellow at the FAI Program for Advanced Study in Politics, Philosophy and Economics at the Mercado Center. He's also a senior scholar at the Cato Institute's Center for Monetary and Financial alternatives. He also blogs regularly at the altem.org uh, and if I might add a uh, free, ba free banking aficionado. So without further ado, welcome uh, um, Professor White and thanks for joining us today. Uh, thanks for having me. Should be fun. Well, before we start, uh, before we start, I would like to uh, take one moment uh, of, of your time and promote the Austrian economics uh, uh, conference, Austrian School of Economics in the 21st century, a conference that will be held in person in Vienna uh, the, on the 3rd, 4th and 5th of November. As the, uh, as the name of the conference says, it's got the Austrian economics, classical liberalism and libertarianism. Uh, we have uh, four distinguished um, um, uh, fellows, uh, scholars uh, as keynote speakers, Hannes Gunnarsson, Mark Skousen, Jeff Booth and Agnieszka Plonka. And I hope that I will see many of you there. And one other thing before we start, don't forget to post your, your questions uh, either on YouTube chat or, or at the Foundation Buses uh, Facebook Live so I can ask the professor. And without any further ado, uh, I think it's time to start the, our discussion here. As the title suggests, we are going to talk about money and um, uh, the past and what else to talk about the past if not gold? So uh, gold was the money of the past, but does it have any advantages today? Um, and in general, and also as in the monetary system of today, should we go back to gold? How is everything connected, Professor? Well, it's a big question. Um, gold, as you say, has been demonetized. Uh, in fact, it's the 50th anniversary of the last link of money to gold, which was the closing of the gold window by the American president, Richard Nixon, in August uh, 1971. Uh, the gold standard still holds potential as a monetary standard. Uh, it, governments failed the gold standard. It wasn't that the gold standard failed. Uh, it was, you know, basically undermined and subverted uh, starting in the First World War, but then through the uh, interwar period, after Second World War, the Bretton Woods system had a role for gold. Uh, the US dollar was pegged to gold and other European currencies were pegged to the US dollar. But the system was set up in a way where central banks ran the show, not the gold standard. Uh, and the Federal Reserve System of the US eventually stopped respecting its obligation to redeem the dollar for gold at $35 an ounce. Uh, and that's when Nixon closed the gold window. The, the Federal Reserve had been printing too much money to be consistent with that uh, exchange rate or that uh, parity for the dollar against gold. And when it came time to either tighten monetary policy or close the gold window, Nixon decided to close the gold window. So it wasn't a failure of gold. Uh, if you look back at the classical period of the gold standard before the First World War, it performed quite well. And nothing has really changed in terms of the, I don't know, the technology of gold mining or minting or uh, banking. So the question is, uh, could we return to a gold standard? and? I've studied the sort of whether we have enough gold to go back to the gold standard without it causing a massive deflation or inflation. Uh, and the answer is yes, we do. Most central banks have kept their gold and there's a lot of gold in private hands uh, that could be monetized. So that's not really the problem. The problem is the lack of willingness to be bound by national governments and central banks. So the, the gold standard provides a kind of model of how to have a non-political money. Under the classical period, many countries didn't have central banks. The US didn't, Canada, 
Australia. Switzerland got one relatively late, uh, not until the 20th century and so on. So it works in an automatic way if it's allowed to work. Uh, it can be censored and overridden and shut down by central banks. And that's unfortunately what happened. But it's still out there as a possibility. Uh, there's not a lot of political support for it at present. Uh, what could bring it back is the failure of our current monetary regimes, fiat money regimes. In a way, I hope that doesn't happen. But should the world, you know, find fiat money's all falling apart, getting into double digit and worse inflation, uh, then there might emerge some more enthusiasm for returning to some kind of gold standard. And I hope it would be a, a depoliticized gold standard, a privatized gold standard, where money that's issued redeemable for gold is issued by private parties and not by central banks, and is therefore more trustworthy because it's a matter of contract and not of you know, public policy. Well, we, we do mention, you, you do, did mention the fiat currency, but after the financial crisis of 2007, 2009, and even now with COVID, with so much money printing, aren't we in a big problem with the current money? Well, so there, wa there was a period uh, right after the closing of the gold window, and actually starting a few years before, in the mid-60s, inflation started to get out of hand. We had double-digit inflation in the U.S. There was more than 20% inflation in the U.K. and in other countries in Europe. Uh, some had even worse experiences. Then things seemed to calm down. Central banks seemed to learn better how to control the quantity of fiat money. That was called the Great Moderation. But then we had the global financial crisis of 2007 to 9, And we had the European uh, sovereign debt crises, and so it's not so clear that fiat money is uh, going to last. That it's, you know, that it that it can be sustained. I hope it can. I mean, I hope we can maintain a low inflation environment. But as you say, in response to the financial panic, central banks seem to sort of lose their commitment to traditional ways of operating. Uh, and began all kinds of new programs of lending and money printing. And in response to the global pandemic now, we've had some very uh, extremely high rates of monetary expansion. In a way, it was appropriate because there, had, there was an increase in the desire to hold money. And so we didn't see an outburst of inflation in the last couple of years. In fact, we had uh, about six months of negative inflation in the U.S. I'm not sure what happened in Europe, but inflation remained low. But as things return to normal, the extra money that was injected needs to be withdrawn in order to avoid inflation. And at least the Federal Reserve is being a little too slow in doing that. And so we've been getting year over year inflation rates above 5%. Uh, Hopefully, it won't get worse, but there is that danger. I mean, the, the problem with a fiat system ultimately is that it's subject to the whims of what seems like good policy at the time, but it's not committed to uh, in any fundamental way to maintain the purchasing power of money. And so if it, well, seems, if it seems like printing money is the thing to do, uh, that becomes the policy. Well, I was going to ask you especially about today uh, and the printing of money. Should we fear now like something like the 1970s? Because we even printed more money, if I'm correct, than, than the 1970s. So isn't, isn't it even scarier than before? There is a time lag, but we see the first inflation uh, moments in some sectors in, in the U.S. for sure. Well, the, the trick is to be alarmed, but not too alarmed. I mean, not to be carried away with uh, the worst kind of fears. It depends. Uh, Double-digit inflation is not already in the cards. 
it depends on what central banks do f- from here on. So they've injected a lot of money, the Fed and the European Central Bank. Now they have a chance to withdraw it. If they withdraw it in a timely manner, if they return to a more normal monetary policy, then we may see a moderation of uh, inflation. So I'm not convinced that we're, uh, it's already in the cards that we're going to see double digit inflation. But if they don't uh, moderate monetary policy, it could happen. There's, there's no guarantee against it. So there's a great uncertainty attached with fiat money because it's not committed to any particular path. Central banks have uh, announced inflation targets, but they don't seem to be responding. So in the U.S., it's 2%, and in Europe, it's 2%. European Eurozone, it's 2%. But they don't seem to be responding in any rapid way to exceeding the target rate of inflation. And in fact, the Fed has said, well, we're going to go slowly in bringing inflation back down because we want to have 2% inflation on average, not in any particular year. And we've been below 2%, so it's okay to run above 2% for a while. But they haven't said how far above or for how long. so we, uh, there's great uncertainty uh, attached with the future. That's, that's true politics, I would say. But why do central banks often go for the 2% inflation? Why is everybody so scared of deflation? Uh, it's a very good question. I mean, the arguments for preferring 2% to 10% would also say you should prefer 0 to 2%. And in a case where prices are driven down by growing productivity, deflation is okay. So actually, minus 1% or 2% is better than zero from the point of view of ordinary holders of money. It's better to get a positive real return on your money than zero. Uh, And under the classical gold standard, the average inflation rate was pretty close to zero. it has been argued by Milton Friedman, among others, that it's better to have deflation. Uh, but I don't think it's the sort of thing that you want the government to engineer. Uh, under a commodity money standard, under a, a gold standard with free banking, I think the historical record indicates that you would have something like 0% inflation. Uh, but you know, more or less, depending on changes in supply and demand, but those changes uh, historically were very moderate. So gold was not a perfectly stable um, purchasing power money, but it was the best we've had uh, in history. Well, that being said, how would you define sound money and how different is it from, from the current fiat system? Why is it better? Well, sound money is a phrase that where sound means like healthy, like a sound body and a sound mind. It's that kind of sound. Uh, what does that mean in practical terms? It means a money that's not being manipulated by central banks or fiscal authorities, uh, a money that can maintain its purchasing power, and especially in the long run. So the the biggest contrast between the behavior of the classical gold standard and current fiat standards is that you knew what the purchasing power of money was going to be 10, 20, 30 years down the road. Uh, If there was a period of a rising purchasing power of gold, that would stimulate gold mining and that would bring gold back to its uh, basically flat trend line, back to its uh, steady state equilibrium path. And so people were comfortable issuing 20, 30, 50 year bonds. You didn't have to worry about the value of the money in which the bond was going to be repaid. That encouraged long-term planning, roundabout production processes. So it helped promote a healthy economy, a sound economy. Whereas the kind of politically manipulated money creates great uncertainty, discourages long-term investment, leads to a lot more risk uh, in making long-term investments because you have to, if you borrow short, you need to roll over the financing 
And then you can get caught if interest rates go up when it's time to refinance. Uh, that's the story of the Austrian theory of the business cycle. It's sort of a warning about what can happen when interest rates are manipulated and people uh, make investment commitments that can't be brought to fruition because monetary policy changes. Well, we, we talk about sound money. We talk about the dollar as the reserve currency. And we I, I think we agree that it's not sound. It, it's not the perfect, far from the perfect. But at the same time, would it be good for, for countries with high inflation like uh, Argentina, Zimbabwe, uh, and so on to, to, to accept dollarization as, as a solution, let's say, to their problems? Right. So the U.S. dollar today is not as sound as the classical gold standard, but it is sounder than the Argentine peso. It's sounder than the Lebanese lira. Uh, and so it's an important principle that people be free to use whatever money they want to use. And in those countries with high inflation uh, that you mentioned, people have been voting with their pocketbooks uh, to hold U.S. dollars. And you get dollarization from the bottom up uh, in countries with high inflation. Uh, an example from 20 years ago is Ecuador, which had uh, hyperinflation. People dollarized themselves. It wasn't prudent to use the uh, government currency when it was hyperinflating. So people began putting their savings in dollars. They began posting prices in dollars. And they began transacting in dollars. And at the end of the period of hyperinflation, nobody wanted the government currency. The only people who had it were government employees who were paid that way. And they immediately would rush to the exchange office and convert to dollars. And eventually the government threw in the towel and said, OK, we're going to officially dollarize. Things are so bad that we can't, the taxes we collect in our local currency aren't worth anything. <laughs> So there was actually a fiscal motive uh, for dollarization. And so I think it would be a good idea uh, in Lebanon, in Argentina, Zimbabwe, other high inflation countries to allow the public to dollarize themselves. And when the use of the government currency gets trivial, uh, I don't know what the benchmark would be, but when it gets to be less than a third of the money in circulation, let's say, it's time to pull the plug and just... Uh, completely uh, dollarized. So the last step is called official dollarization, where the government itself begins to accept dollars in taxes and pay public sector wages in taxes, uh, sorry, in dollars. Yeah, I, I was asking, I was asking this and the next, because on the one hand, we would prefer more competition, but on the other hand, um, at what point competition is enough? Because we have the dollar, the Swiss franc, the pound, and obviously some countries cannot cannot uh, prosper with their own. So, so why don't we why don't we see more and more countries uh, with high inflation, with big money problems? Let's say uh, dollarized. Let's say. Well, the governments tend to think that they get a fiscal advantage from having their own currency that they can pay their bills by printing money. But eventually they get to the point where that doesn't work anymore. Uh, and that's when they are willing to toss in the towel. Um, but the, the public needs to agitate for the right uh, to use whatever currency they want to use. And then we can see whether they prefer the local currency or dollars or euros or gold or Bitcoin or something else. I well, we, we, we talk a lot about like the present fiat at the moment, but what, what is the future of the big currencies? As I mentioned, even uh, let's include the yuan now. What is the future of, of the euro, the dollar, and the yuan, for example? Again, the pound, it, it all what, what will the future hold? Well, it, it the future is not yet written, it depends on <laughs> what central banks do in those countries, uh, whether they pursue relatively sound, I guess is the word, or moderate monetary policy in order to keep inflation down. Um, 
And it's hard to predict. I mean, it would, it would be different from country to country, but those currencies can survive if they will behave themselves, if the central banks will behave themselves. Uh, and the fiat dollar can survive if the Fed will behave itself. But it's good to have plan B. It's good to have alternatives. And in countries where the central bank has created very high inflation, uh, it's absolutely a good thing for the public to be able to use better currencies. Um, and the US dollar seems to be the most popular uh, in countries like Zimbabwe and Lebanon and Argentina because it has an established network. There is a you know global payment network uh, using the dollar. Whereas newcomers uh, like Bitcoin uh, are harder to access, uh, are more volatile in value uh, in purchasing power. And so they have trouble getting off the ground in any big way. And likewise, uh, a, a return to the gold standard spontaneously from the bottom up uh, is difficult to imagine without there being high inflation in all the fiat currencies. Well, we, we again, from fiat, let's go to most modern times. And that, of course, is uh, Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. So what are their advantages compared to uh, co compared to the central bank's fiat and are they the future? Well, uh, Bitcoin is fascinating and it's been a remarkable success in the sense of going from no value to being worth nearly a trillion dollars. Uh, I didn't check the market cap this morning, but it's been in that neighborhood. Uh, so it's a big success as an asset, as an investment vehicle. People who got in early have earned you know, big returns. It's not been so successful as a medium of exchange. Uh, and that's because the purchasing power is very volatile. And that volatility is really built in to the Bitcoin design. So uh, Bitcoin has a predetermined release schedule. So we know the quantity of Bitcoin and what it's going to be at every date in the future. And we know it's going to max out at 21 million units. So that's reassurance to holders of Bitcoin that its value won't be diluted or eroded by big issues in the future. We know that's not going to happen. Uh, I mean, it's conceivable that uh, there could be a coordinated attack on the Bitcoin uh, system, the so-called 51% attack, but it's not likely because uh, the people who are operating the system, the so-called miners, uh, don't want to kill the goose that lays the golden eggs. So uh, it has that virtue, but because the quantity doesn't respond to increases in demand, but only the price responds, or to decreases in demand, you have a very volatile uh, price or purchasing power for Bitcoin. And that makes a commonly accepted medium of exchange in the future. Uh, it could change if fiat money becomes a lot more volatile than it is now. But actually, I would think uh, people would return to gold sooner than they would adopt Bitcoin because the volatility of gold, even demonetized gold today, is not nearly as great as that of Bitcoin. Well, I was going to ask you, since Hayek wrote the, the nationalization of money uh, five years after after the Nixon shock and uh, we he, ab he abandoned the, the gold standard. And he talks about currencies uh, competing be between each other. Yes. So especially with the cryptos, th this is the uh, money have different uh, functions. Would maybe the future be different competing monies that have uh, they're perfect in only one of the functions but like the other function for example maybe store of value as in gold but not as a medium of exchange so the the denationalization of money is an important book and everybody should read it and it was important in my intellectual development uh, but i came to think that Hayek's prediction of what would prevail in a market of denationalized monies 
was not really what we should expect. So he talked about first simply allowing people to use any currency that exists. So in 1976, that meant they could use gold or silver if they wanted to, but they could use fiat monies from other countries if they wanted to. And he thought that would provide some discipline for central banks. And I think there's some truth to that. Uh, and of course, we saw before the Eurozone, we saw countries in Southern Europe pegging their currency to the Deutsche Mark because the public was abandoning the, let's say, the Italian lira to hold their savings in Deutsche Marks. So they wanted to make the lira as sound as the Deutsche Mark. So there is something to that kind of competition. In the denationalization of money, Hayek then, so that first book was a pamphlet was called Choice in Currency. In the denationalization of money, he said, well, wait a minute, why don't we allow private competitors? And here's what they might do. They might issue private money and promise to attract customers. They would promise to keep the purchasing power stable in terms of some basket of goods. So they would stabilize the consumer price index. Uh, and if they started to drift away from purchasing power stability, the press would report on what was happening and they would lose customers. So they would have to reverse course very quickly. And that's what he expected to prevail. Uh, private monies, not redeemable for gold, not redeemable for any basket of commodities, but simply pegged to a basket of commodities by the issuer promising to keep the purchasing power stable. Uh, and I think there are two problems with that prediction. One is that there are strong network effects, as Carl Menger taught us, in using a common money. You want to use the money that's the easiest to spend, and that's the one that the most other potential trading partners are using. And so you look around and see what other people are using as money, and you're willing to accept that as money. Then there's a convergence on a common money. It's inconvenient to use a money that's fluctuating in value compared to monies that your trading partners are using. So Hayek, I think, de-emphasized or underplayed the strength of those convergence processes in imagining dozens of private currencies with floating exchange rates against one another. And the second yeah. thing is that the promise not to inflate the currency is not very strong. Uh, I mean, it, it's in danger of being violated when it becomes profitable to do so. So if there's no contractual commitment to buy back your currency for a commodity or a basket of commodities, then when you decide to inflate, nobody can sue you. But once you have a base of customers holding your uh, accepting your money, there's a very tempting profit in printing more of it. Historically, how was that problem solved? It was solved by private money being redeemable for gold or silver. So that gave the money holders the right to sue uh, for recovery of the gold or silver they'd been promised. And more than that, it gave the issuer a, an everyday guideline. When they saw gold reserves flowing out, they knew they had to tighten their monetary issues. And when reserves were flowing in, then they that suggested people wanted to hold more of their uh, notes or deposits and they could issue more. So under a free banking system with a commodity standard, the quantity of money becomes self-regulating. When it's at the discretion of private issuers, it's a different story. Uh, so I don't see that scenario of competing private irredeemable monies uh, being what we should expect to prevail in the absence of legal obstacles to it. Now, as I, as I indicated earlier, Bitcoin solves the credibility problem in a different way, not by promising a certain purchasing power or redeemability, but by promising the quantity. We know how many Bitcoin have been issued and are going to be issued. So we can trust that there won't be a hyperinflationary burst. And in fact, there isn't any discretionary issuer of Bitcoin. Right? The quantity is governed by a program a program that's open source so anybody can look at it and see that uh, 
the quantity issued is actually adhering to the program. But that comes with great volatility of purchasing power, that way of solving the credibility problem. So as I said, it, it makes Bitcoin uh, credible as a store of value, but not something you most people want to use as a medium of exchange. Well, one, one thing be, before we, we move on, I always, when we say network, effect, net, network effects, I always think of MySpace and how they were going to dominate the world in social media, and then they collapsed uh, out of nowhere, but Facebook is the today's uh, giant with the network effects. Why don't, can't we expect that from Bitcoin or cryptocurrency or any private currency instead of the, the, the king that is the dollar now? Well, and furthermore, uh, one, sorry, one more, one more. Uh, I, what I would say, many people would call it a problem with with uh, um, uh, Bitcoin in times of crisis and war. You you print money to finance the problems in a sense, and that's what everybody accept. Most people accept as the correct way, and Bitcoin does not allow that. For example, so is that the good part or the bad part of the of, of the cryptocurrency? No, that's that's a good part. Uh, mostly governments finance their wars these days by borrowing, and they finance big budget deficits by borrowing rather than by printing money. Uh, if you look at what share of government budgets is financed by printing money, in wealthier countries, it's typically 1%, 2%, not more than that. Uh, in countries that are desperate, in, in countries like Lebanon and Argentina, it's more than that. But that's because they have trouble collecting other taxes. Uh, so historically, the use of printing money to pay for wars uh, is no longer all that common. But yes, uh, tying the government's hands so that it can't finance spending by printing money is a good thing. But there, Bitcoin's not the only way to do it. There can be other kinds of rules, even in a fiat regime or in a gold standard regime uh, that's sort of off the table. If we enforce the, the gold standard strictly and don't repeat uh, the mistake that was made in the First World War, going off gold to print money with the promise of coming back and then never really coming back. But you, your point about network effects is a good point. In private proprietary networks, entrepreneurs can overcome uh, network effects. They can compete for to be the dominant network. So we saw uh, VHS drive out Betamax and what is it? Blu-ray drive out high definition DVD. Uh, and that's because there's a proprietary interest in doing so. There's a profit to be made and often the strategy involves giving away the product until you have a l large enough base of customers that you can start charging for it uh, for the network effect that is available to your customers. But in the case of Bitcoin, it's not a proprietary network. There's nobody who stands to gain by subsidizing adoption uh, of Bitcoin. Uh, so I'm not sure how that problem would be overcome. But I mean, I think it's more than that. I mean, we do see people switch their own monetary standard in high inflation economies, right? So we see spontaneous dollarization uh, and without it, without it being subsidized, simply because the incumbent standard becomes so bad. Right? But what people turn to is the next best thing. Uh, and the next best thing has to also have a, a wide array of users uh, and, and be relatively stable in purchasing power. So it's the US dollar, although it, in, on the periphery of the Eurozone, it's the Euro because, they're, well, because of the transactions network. Yeah, well, we, we talk about Bitcoin and cryptocurrency, but nowadays it's even fashionable for the central banks to have their cryptocurrencies. So what? <laughs> I cannot even understand properly what they mean by central bank uh, digital currencies. So what's the deal with, with, with the central banks? 
Yeah, it's a good question. The, the label central bank digital currency is misleading because in most cases, they're not talking about currency. They're actually talking about deposit accounts, uh, giving everybody an account on the balance sheet of the central bank. Uh, so in the US, we call that the Fed account model. It's not a currency. It's everybody gets a checking account on the books of the Federal Reserve System. Uh, so it's it's very different proposal. Now, some people have proposed something like a central bank cryptocurrency. In the US, we call that model FedCoin uh, as a play on Bitcoin. But that kind of system means you have a, a decentralized ledger. I mean, that's what's distinctive about the Bitcoin governance system. It's not one central ledger the way central banks have for clearing transactions. Uh, the payment processing is decentralized, but it's hard to believe that a central bank would allow that, that would, would cede control of the payment network to a decentralized uh, market. Uh, and one of the attractions of the central bank account model that the Chinese government is taking advantage of is the opportunity to monitor everybody's payments. So it's a surveillance method. Uh, so surveillance and enforcing taxes more effectively uh, and preventing uh, money laundering, those are some of the motives behind this central bank uh, digital currency, so-called digital currency uh, movement. But it's mostly not for a currency that uh, in the usual sense of circulating outside any central control anonymously that national governments do not want to promote they want to restrict privacy. So the model that's really uh, more likely to be adopted, unfortunately, is the uh, deposit model. And as we see in China, that poses a great risk to privacy. Well, I, I, would, I would call this like the third hand of the, of the movement that, that wants to just ban even $20 bills because criminals use them. I think, if correct me if I'm wrong, but crypto gave gave them like the necessary ammunition to to go the extra step and in the name of security and everything connected with the good of the country uh, for central banks um, as the right hand of governments to to go and control even more the society. Would you agree with that notion? Well, I'm not sure what you mean by crypto empowering them. I mean. Cryptocurrencies are a technology that is decentralized, not controlled by governments at present. And so it's a way to escape uh, financial surveillance and to retain some privacy. And so there is one niche in which uh, Bitcoin is used as a medium for ex of exchange, as, as a way of transmitting value. Uh, and that is for transfers that want to escape the central bank uh, network and its surveillance and censorship. So if you want to send money to a dissident group in Belarus, you can't send it through the banking system because the government controls the banking system and they'll stop it. But you can send Bitcoin. Uh, so that's true in other places around the world too. So that is a niche use of Bitcoin uh, as a medium of exchange or as a payment medium, but it's for ordinary transactions, uh, everyday purchases that it's not going to be, it's less likely to be commonly adopted. Uh, but yes, central banks sometimes use the, uh, the language of cryptocurrency. They talk about a, a digital currency as though something like Bitcoin is what they're going to produce, but that's really a kind of bait and switch. That's not that's what, what I meant to produce. With, that's what I meant with crypto empower the crypto fame empower them for so they can talk about the, the uh, central bank dig digital currencies, which are as you said previously are nothing like crypto and 
uh, real digital currencies. But would you, what would you say are the biggest threats to money today, to the fiat system as a whole, but to money by any definition you would say? Would it be crypto? Would it be the inflation, uh, the po possible inflation in the future, the money printing or something else? I don't see crypto uh, uh, the way it is now. I mean, run privately. I don't see that as a threat. That's an option. Uh, and it provides a valuable option if you want to route uh, a payment around the uh, status quo system. I mean, the biggest threat to fiat money, to the it preserving its purchasing power, uh, is as it always has been, and as you said earlier, it's politics. It's the fact that it, the central banks are government agencies, and so they, although central bank independence is kind of a mantra, uh, it's very difficult to maintain in practice. And in the financial crisis of 2007 to nine, and in the uh, pandemic, in the U.S., the Federal Reserve, which prides itself as an independent central bank, surrendered a lot of its independence, started working hand in hand with the U.S. Treasury to try to make loans uh, to parties that were considered worthy borrowers uh, and supporting this market and that market uh, and that's, that can lead to uh, central banks printing money uh, under the direction of finance ministries and treasury departments. Uh, and so that's the, the biggest threat, that it printing money can, in the short run, be very popular. And so if there's a, a view that, you know, we should have more money uh, per paid out to more people uh, for whatever reason, uh, the central bank is looked at as the place where the money can be printed. And the idea that this is going to dilute the value of money and leave middle and lower class people worse off by uh, washing away their savings, uh, well, that's some down, somewhere down the road. Um, you know, political thinking is notoriously short term. So you can get uh, countries getting into an inflationary cycle. As we've seen, as we saw in the 1970s, uh, and central bankers say they've learned the lesson from that decade, but <laughs> they could unlearn it. <laughs> <laughs> they lie. <laughs> um, I was, I, I was um, going to ask you, in 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 since ever since Mont Pelerin Society was created, there uh, every uh, I mean classical liberals thought about money all the time, and Friedman Friedman is um, famous for saying that government involvement in money is inevitable, and the best so so that is why he approached uh, uh, it differently with giving more control to the central bank. So why how would we fight if he was correct that? we are part of society and we cannot cannot like, escape the central bank how can we fight it best to restrict the power of the central bank and the central government you mentioned the mont pelerin society uh, i became a member i don't know about 20 years ago but for a long time there was very little discussion of money in the mont pelerin society because they were exhausted by the earlier round of debates between monetarists who wanted a responsible fiat money policy and people who have still advocated a return to the gold standard. Uh, in the 50s and 60s, people like Jacques Rueff and, uh, well, Hayek at that point, Mises. Um, and so they kind of decided not to argue about it anymore. <laughs> but after uh, Hayek's denationalization of money, it I guess became possible uh, to talk about money again. Uh, so it's a very difficult question how to preserve fiat money against uh, debauching by 
uh, governments with short time horizons. Uh, it would be nice if we could go back to a system that doesn't require central banks. So uh, what I have in mind, of course, is a gold standard with free banking. Uh, it may be true that it's not going to happen uh, in my lifetime, certainly, maybe not in your lifetime. Uh, I think it's useful to have as an ideal to understand that it works so that we can answer critics who say, well, of course, government has to run the monetary system. Uh, no, government doesn't have to run the monetary system. If we don't yet, if the opponents of central banking don't yet have the political clout uh, to limit it, then we can at least demand that it perform no worse uh, than the classical gold standard. So you know, keep inflation down is the single task that issuers of fiat money should uh, be devoted to because it's really the only task they can accomplish. Uh, they can't improve the real performance of the economy. Uh, they hoped, the Keynesians at least, hoped to smooth out the business cycle using monetary policy, but they haven't succeeded. Friedman granted, uh, acknowledged that, understood that. In fact, he was one of the main people to make that point convincing to more economists that uh, counter-cyclical monetary policy was not working in practice. And the, the most recent cycles have given us more evidence of that. Um, so I think the financial crisis of 2007, 2009 was preceded by a period of overly easy money. Um, and John Taylor, who was recently president of the Mont Pelerin Society, uh, has probably done more than anybody in recent years to amplify that message. Although he wants to, uh, his program for controlling the issue of, of money, I think is relatively mild <laughs> compared to mine. <laughs> well, I, I wanted to ask you, um, why do different schools of thought in economics view money differently? And in not just schools of thought, but ideological camps, uh, um, uh, going like left, right, Democrats, Republicans, Libertarians, why is the divide? Well, I think there's a, a scientific issue at the root of it. Uh, and I think there are basically two ways to think about money, if we sort of go to the most basic question about money. And that is, is money a market phenomenon from the bottom up? Or is money something that needs to be engineered from the top down? And historically, Carl Menger right, provided us a theory of how money emerges from the bottom up. And his opponents advocated what we know as the state theory of money, saying, no, no, money was invented by some wise king, uh, or at least coinage was invented by some wise king, uh, for which, by the way, uh, the anthropological evidence uh, doesn't support. It supports Menger more than the state theory of money. Um, but when it comes to dealing with money today, it, Economists, most economists today are not trained in the Austrian way of thinking. They're trained in a kind of social engineering way of thinking. The job of economists is to study the economy so that we can control it, so that we can smooth out business cycles, so that we can remedy market failures and achieve optima by clever interventions. Uh, and so they think about money in that same way. It's our job. Uh, government has to provide money because I've seen this argument made many times by people who are otherwise good economists. <laughs> money is a public good, they say, ignoring the fact that money does not satisfy the characteristics of a public good. Right? It's not non, it's not non-rival in consumption. The money I use, you can't use. It's rival in consumption. And it's excludable. The money in my pocket, I can keep from being in your pocket. So it's a private good. There's no reason to expect markets to fail to provide it unless you can come up with some kind of um, externality problem or some aspect of money 
that has uh, public characteristics, but the arguments are remarkably weak. Uh, I've got chapters in my book, The Theory of Monetary Institutions, that go through those arguments and show, I think, how weak they are. Uh, that the the market the market theory of money is well supported. The idea that money is a public good is is the theory is an empty box. There's really nothing there. But that I think is kind of at root, uh, and th this engineering mentality, which is of course uh, encouraged by central banks. The number one employer of monetary economists around the world are the central banks. And even if you don't work for the central bank, you might be a consultant to the central bank, or you might <laughs> want to attend their conferences. You might want to submit papers to a journal, some of the editors of which are affiliated with the central bank uh, in some way. Um, and so that's a, a problem. The central banks influence the research agenda because they're the biggest employer. Well, there is a uh, question from the audience and uh, we are nearing the uh, the end of this discussion. So do, do ask your questions. Uh, Orkun asks, do you think a system with limited money supply increase that has market clearing mechanism is possible? I'm not sure what's meant by a market clearing mechanism, but yes, a system that limits the growth of the money supply is certainly possible. The classical gold standard provided such a system, but even under fiat money, it would be possible to have a rule. Uh, I'm not sure we've seen one yet, but in a way, Bitcoin gives us a model of how to write a really strict rule uh, that would limit the growth of the money supply. I certainly think that's feasible. I, I want to ask you, two more questions and both are Friedman questions. One would be, he, he had a book free to choose, but he was not uh, willing to go with money and free, freedom to choose. Why was that? Well, he did uh, avoid talking about money and free to choose, but that free to choose was, I believe, 1980. Uh, yes. In 1986, yes. Friedman co-authored with Anna Schwartz, who was also his co-author on the monetary history of the United States, uh, a paper called Does Government Have Any Role in Money? And he took back a lot of the position he had established earlier in his career. Uh, for example, in his uh, program for monetary stability of 1960, he said, well, we can't have free banking because there's too much fraud. But then he read the research that had been done on free banking. And in the 1986 paper, he said, oh, well, no, that, that was wrong. Uh, lots of money issuers have established redeemability and carried it out successfully for decades. So uh, that's not really a problem. The sticking point for Friedman and Schwartz, though, what, what they were uh, unwilling to allow, well, they seem to think that deposit insurance had to stay around. Uh, but uh, Friedman's position uh, improved a lot. I, mean, I can share an anecdote. Uh, when I wrote my first piece on free banking, which was published in the Cato Journal in 1983, it's before my uh, free banking in Britain was published, I got a handwritten note from Milton Friedman because I had chosen him as a target. I said, well, Friedman says we can't have free banking for this reason, but here's why he's wrong. I got a handwritten note from Milton Friedman saying, my position has changed. It's not as far from yours as you think. <laughs> so that was very uh, nice to hear. And not because he had read something I had written, but because he had read what uh, people like Hugh Rockoff had written about the free banking experience in the United States. Uh, and because he had come to the conclusion that trying to get the Fed to follow a rule was not going to happen, it was better to replace the Fed with a robot, was the way he liked to put it sometimes. Well, as I've said, I'm going back and going to end with Friedman, even though we are, again, Austrian econ economists. He, he, he has a paper, I think, has government any role in money? Right. And That's the one I just referred to, yeah. 
Yeah. So, so, so what would you say? I mean, Larry White. What would you, Larry White 2021 say is the role of money in government? Um, I don't think government needs to have any role in money any more than it has in the production of bread. Uh, market mechanisms will take care of the supply of money, will take care of banking, will provide an efficient payment system, and one that caters to what the public wants uh, in a money. Uh, somebody needs to enforce contracts in money in the same way that somebody needs to enforce contracts in bread. Uh, and so I'll, I'll make that conditional. If you think that government needs to be the contract, contract enforcement agency, then there's some role that government plays. But as I said, no more than it plays in the bread industry. And, and that's what the ideal of free banking means. It means banks operate on the same kind of legal rules that all other businesses operate. So there have to be laws against fraud, uh, but the system will regulate itself. Well, uh, since we are nearing the end, I have one more question. Um, and it's going to be connected with Bitcoin and fiat and everything. The, the idea is, by definition, Bitcoin is a deflationary uh, money asset, however we're going to call it, because it has like fixed fixed uh, amount of Bitcoin that will be produced at some point. So mm -hmm. can people uh, work around that? Because now when you go to invest money, you expect to get more. But with Bitcoin... That is very different be, be, because it's a deflationary currency. How can, can society function properly with the new logic behind a deflationary currency? So the, the meaning of the statement that Bitcoin is deflationary is that the quantity of Bitcoin becomes fixed at some point in the near future, yeah. like 15 years from now or something. It, it maxes out at 21 million units. So after that, the supply of Bitcoin is constant. And if Bitcoin were the money at that point, if it were being used as the unit of account and medium of exchange, so goods are being priced in Bitcoin and being sold for Bitcoin, then as the economy grows, as output grows, you have more goods chasing the same quantity of Bitcoin, you would expect falling prices. That would be true of fiat dollars if the supply of fiat dollars were frozen, which is something Milton Friedman recommended at one point, by the way. Uh, and it's true of a classical gold standard to the extent, not that the quantity of monetary gold is ever fixed because the mining industry goes on, but it's true to the extent that the output of goods grows faster than the quantity of monetary gold, which has been true during some periods. So that gives you falling prices. But if prices are falling at the rate at which output is growing, which is what you expect with a fixed money supply, it's not a problem. It means that the interest rate is going to be very close to zero, but it doesn't require that the interest rate become negative. And so you earn a positive return not by earning a positive interest rate, but by being repaid in a money of rising purchasing power. So you earn a real return just by holding money. Uh, and the question sometimes raised about that is, well, but then why would anybody invest in anything else? Well, for the same reason they invest in anything but government bonds, right? In, a, in an environment with, let's say 2% inflation, and government bonds paying 2%, you might ask yourself, oh, let's say government bonds paying 3%, so you get a positive return. You might ask yourself, why would anybody invest in anything else when they can earn money without any risk? And the answer is you can earn more money if you're willing to take a risk. Entrepreneurs can earn money by investing in new projects. You can earn a higher return by picking corporate IOUs that pay more than government IOUs. There is a default risk, but if you pick them well, you can earn a high return. You can earn a higher return by investing in stocks. Again, it comes with more risk, 
but even after adjusting for the risk, you get a higher re real return after the fact. So the fact that you earn a positive real return just holding money doesn't uh, do anything to discourage investment uh, in the economy. People will invest for the same reason they invest in a positive inflation environment in order to earn a better return. Well, with that, uh, we are ending today's webinar. Um, Professor, would you like any last words? Uh, well, uh, we could have talked about uh, the Austrian theory of the business cycle. I guess we mentioned it, and we mentioned Menger's theory of the origin of money, and those are the two most important aspects of Austrian uh, monetary theory. So I guess, uh, no, there's nothing else I thought we uh, overlooked completely. Um, I'm writing a book now, uh, the working title of which is Better Money, uh, Gold, Fiat, or Bitcoin. And so these are the issues that are on my <laughs> mind, uh, sort of head-to-head -head comparisons among different monetary standards. Well, uh, this, this fits perfectly. <laughs> For the so one once the book is published, we can do this uh, again and explain the inner workings of everything. I'd be happy to sure. Well, with that, um, I would like to thank uh, Professor Larry White for joining us today for, with uh, with this webinar uh, about money, the past, the present, and the future. I would like to uh, again. Uh, mention the Austrian Economics uh, Austrian Economics Conference and Fundation Buses in November, the Austrian Economics School in the 21st century, uh, Vienna, 3rd, of, 3rd, 4th, and 5th of November. Again, hope to see many of you there. And the call for papers ends on the 19th of September. And in the next few weeks, we are going to have uh, another 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 webinar about, about uh, that, that will be strictly cryptocurrencies. Uh, so check it out uh, on social media and uh, to and until next time, see you.